Alrighty, sweet. Thank you, Matt. Hello and welcome everyone to the Climate Justice Webinar here on October 21st. Uh, my name is Summer Peltzer and I'm the Diversity and Inclusion Coordinator for the Office of Sustainability. And first, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northern Arizona University sits on the base of the San Francisco Peaks on the homelands sacred to Native Americans throughout the region. We honor their past, present, future, and future generations who have lived here for millennia and will, will forever call this place home. Alrighty, um, so this is an overview of our agenda for today. First, we would like to spend a few minutes welcoming and introducing our panelists. And then we will pass it off to um, the panelists uh, to discuss what cl uh, climate justice today. Um, then we will have a 30 minute interactive group dialogue and then a few more minutes for closing statements. Thank you, Summer. Uh, what is climate justice? I think this means a lot of different things to everyone and it depends on your uh, experience and your lived experience on this earth and, and in your communities. Um, so by no means am I going to offer a comprehensive definition, but from, from my perspective and what I've read, uh, climate justice is really intersectional in its nature. It ties a lot of issues together as represented in the sustainable uh, development goals from the UN, the 17 goals there you see, they all interact uh, in, in unique ways and they're all tied together intricately. Uh, we also know that marginalized people are in fact the most affected by climate change, which makes this uh, issue the nexus, uh, the issue of justice, really the nexus of the climate crisis and uh, issues of poverty, issues of literacy, issues of clean air, clean water, um, really circulate around justice and that social inequalities um, uh, can increase uh, and as a response to climate change. We know that it will exacerbate those changes. And locally, I just wanted to, to point out two uh, local examples. Uh, one is the, the Navajo Generating Station, which closed in 2019. A lot of environmental activists and even myself said, yes, you know, this is a great step. We do need to move away from fossil fuel uh, extraction for our energy and, and use uh, and the air pollution and the public health ramifications are huge, getting people out of coal mines. But also there's the issue of uh, jobs uh, and issues of, um, I think uh, it was around 800 jobs that were lost when that generating station shut down in the Page area in Northern Arizona. And also the issue that uh, there's many residents on uh, tribal land on Navajo Nation uh, that use coal for heating in their homes. So when that mine shuts down, what is gonna happen? And how do we ensure a just transition of moving from fossil fuels to hopefully more renewable energy sources? And you can see these issues start to get really nuanced. And the other one I wanted to call out is one uh, here in Flagstaff in the Rio de Flag flood control project and how it impacts the south side neighborhood. I, I pulled up a map here and you'll see that the south side is you know, just north of Northern Arizona University and then uh, just uh, south of downtown, just south of the tracks. And majority of the south side is in a uh, floodplain, a FEMA declared floodplain. And the south side has such a diverse history. They have a, a, a history of segregation. Uh, they have a history of um, of uh, marginalized people coming and really building the Flagstaff economy, whether that was African-American uh, lumberyard workers or Hispanic railroad workers or Asian business owners or Basque, uh, Spanish Basque sheep herders, uh, they lived in the South Side. And uh, this uh, fact that they live in a floodplain really holds them back in three key ways uh, and has held the neighborhood uh, underwater, hypothetically, um, for many years. Um, Flood insurance premiums, they're getting more and more expensive. Um, the actual threat of flooding, there's a lot of streets that get blocked in the south side during monsoon season or homes that get flooded. And then also it limits their ability to do renovations on the homes. Um, so it's not just an environmental issue. These aren't just environmental issues. These are so intricately tied um, to social issues. And I think that's what I wanted to share. And then I'm gonna pass it back to Summer and she's gonna help. Oh, you know what? We have one step. I missed the step we are gonna do some community engagement to kind of um, 
help warm us all up. I know how uh, daunting sitting on Zoom calls can be. We want to get engagement early. We want to hear from you what climate justice means to you. So if you could open up a new browser or pull out your smartphone and go to sift.ly, S-I-F-T.ly, and enter the participation code justice. So sift.ly justice. And then we will get to the panelists, but a little bit of engagement first. Uh, I'm going to switch screens here, so don't mind me. Um, and let us know in the chat if you're having any issues there. Yes, I see the comment from Mayor Evans, and that's the same history that I've heard as well, that in the early 1900s, the, the Rio de Flag was a man-made channel. They cut that through the south side to limit flooding the north side of the tracks. Um, that piece gets missed in Flagstaff's history often, and thank you, Mayor, for, um, for bringing that up. Okay, has everyone been able to get onto the sif.ly um, site with the code justice? If so, feel free to start punching in uh, your responses and no wrong answers. What does it mean to you personally in your community? I'm not getting it. Hey Matt, how how do I do that? I think it has to start. Okay, let me make sure I'm. It's or you have to start sifting. It says. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me go here in the back end and make sure I got it going on. It says it is running. Hmm. Let me, I will work on this, but while we wait on me to do that, I'm going to pass it back to um, Summer and she's going to help introduce our panelists and we'll come back to this question. So hold your ideas in your head, write them down somewhere. Uh, we definitely want to hear from you all. Put them in the chat even. Uh, that could be a good backup. We want to uh, get our brains moving in this direction as we hear from these panelists. So Summer, I'll pass it to you to help introduce our panelists. Awesome. Thank you. Alrighty, so uh, first I would like to introduce Mayor Coral Evans. Um, she is a third generation Flagstaff resident. She um, was elected to city council in 2018 and 2012 and as mayor in 2016 and 2018. She is also the executive director of the Sunnyside Neighborhood Association of Flagstaff, a resident driven social nonprofit organization that focuses on redevelopment. She is currently running for Arizona State House in this 2020 election. So thank you so much for coming. Um, and then next we have uh, Nikki Cooley, who is the co-manager for the Institute uh, for Tribal Environmental Professionals, also known as ITEP, uh, Tribal Exchange Program. And she has worked with the Miriam Powell Center for Environmental Research on a climate change education program and at NAU, uh, NAU's talent search working with underrepresented low income potential first generation college students at 10 middle and high school um, high schools in northern Arizona. Thank you again for coming. Next we have Ted Martinez, who is the director of research experience uh, for undergraduates, as well as a senior lecturer in the NAU Honors College, where he uses climate fiction novels to teach climate change imp uh, impacts and communication. He believes the most important thing we can do is to increase our effectiveness um, as a society in our battle against climate change and, do, and to diversify the existing narrative, narratives and contingency of climate change. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Summer. We proposed three questions to the panelists, and I hope they feel the freedom to uh, move from these, but we thought it was a good way to start the conversation and, and hear from each of them. Uh, what does climate justice mean to you? That The same answer we, we asked you all just a minute ago. Uh, what are some things in your lifetime that you have noticed have, have significantly changed in your community? And then lastly, how do you think climate action planning uh, can really help with the ever-changing climate issues, both politically and environmentally, in our community. And we'd like to um, start with Nikki, if that's okay. Um, and Nikki, we, we have about 10 minutes for each panelist. We will give you uh, like a two minute warning 
uh, just so you know where you're at. But um, thank you again for joining us, and I'll pass the hypothetical microphone to you. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so great. Um, Yate, she a Nikki Cooley dash a jinne, Kenya Ani Nishlo, look at the Nair Ebashish Chin, um, Zatlana Ebash Nale, Tohe, um, Lini Ebash Che. I think I already said that. Uh, Shah Tode, Do Bestot, is in the Shkis there in Nasha, uh, Hot Awe Dine, a son in Nishla. Many of you that are on here may have are, um, heard me, uh, introduce myself in the Navajo way. And um, and I always do this out of respect, not only for my relatives that are of the five fingered beings, uh, but also my our other relatives that are in the sky, in the air, in the water, and all around us. And so, um, because our my clan in the Navajo is very much tied to the environment and actually tied to what I do for my profession. So I'm of the Tyron House clan, born for the Reed people. Um, clan. My maternal grandparents are of the water that flows together clan. Um, and my paternal grandparents are of the many goats clan. And I come from two small communities in uh, Arizona called Shanto in Blue Gap, Arizona. Shanto Begay is my neighbor across the canyon. So I always, we always like to say he is from the east side and I'm from the west side. Um, uh, thank you, Summer, for that amazing um, uh, introduction. Um, I and and Matt, um, do you mind? I think you're still on the speaker view. Do you mind putting me on speaker view? I don't know if anybody can see that. Um, just for I think it makes it easier for people to listen and hear me. Definitely. I appreciate that. Um, as Summer mentioned, I am one of the co-managers of ITEP's Tribes and Climate Change Program. So what does that mean? I work across the country basically with my colleague, Karen Cosetto, who's out of Boulder, Colorado, and I help um, and assist tribes in any way possible to help them write climate adaptation and tribal hazard mitigation plans, whether that's finding funding or finding um, the, the right partners. And sometimes that means writing it with them, um, but also making sure that they know that they should include their culture, that they should in include their language and their stories that are not uh, sensitive, um, meaning that it's okay to share with the public. Um, because before then it was all written by primarily by non-native um, or management plans were written by non-native um, people for the for these uh, tribal folks and so I really love my job I uh, my goal is to visit all 574 tribes and they all have management plans that include climate change um, in there um, I want to start out with the quote that my one of my mentors, Celso Villegas from the Danaotham tribe down south on the, uh, the Mexico and Arizona border that was created by the governments. Um, he said, tribes have always adapted. We just have to adapt even quicker. And that really resonated with me. And I always um, mentioned that. Um, before I move on, I want to acknowledge um, some of my elders, which is also the appropriate thing to do. And when I say elders, it's not because of your age. I mean, my, one of my elders are, I think they're like 10 years younger than I am. It's the knowledge that they know. So I want to acknowledge Pete Filet, um, who is my, one of my mentors and professors when I was at the NEU School of Forestry where I have two degrees um, in forestry with an emphasis on traditional knowledge uh, from, and also Patrick Grady, I think I saw his name on here, Patrick Grady, but also Mayor Coral Evans. I really appreciate all you have done uh, for our community and will continue to do so. So I just wanted to um, acknowledge um, those folks. So, um, so in answering the question, um, I guess, what does climate justice mean to me? I'm a native Navajo Diné indigenous woman. And um, from the beginning, we were taught that we should care for our environment. Now I know in the news, there's some of our leadership that like and want to continue with fossil fuel endeavors, but the majority of us uh, 
want equitable, clean energy. And, and, and what that means to me is that we have to be part of all the conversations, whether it's being a part of it at the table or leading it um, in all decision-making process processes, um, equity in funding, receiving the funds to actually address these climate impacts in our communities. Um, the Obama administration gave almost $10 million to the Bureau of Indian Affairs to address climate change. And you, that seems like a lot of money, but when you spread that across over 570, uh, back then I think it was way less than that, 560 something tribes, that's not enough, that's pennies. So we need, we need, we're trying to find more diverse uh, pools of funding, um, but also the understanding among all, but especially um, the, the male dominated um, members of our society, but also, you know, female, uh, but also, I guess, just, should I just say the dominant members of our society should understand that the impact from climate change doesn't care about your income, doesn't care about the color of your skin, what gender you are. But what is inequitable is that um, the response and help received from the government and the different institutions that help um, people in these situations is very few and far between. There's not enough and often, um, yeah, I feel like uh, there's not enough people that get um, in these vulnerable communities that get the help that they need right away. And the things that I've seen in my lifetime that have significantly changed, I'm 40 years old and I'm not bragging, just making the point that in my short lifetime, when I grew up herding sheep, 50 miles round trip, and that is not a joke, um, that I used to herd sheep to the different water sources around, you know, my region, around my community in Shanto, is that some of those wells have dried up and they are still drying up. My parents um, have to haul water still for themselves, for their livestock, to wash their clothes, to clean themselves, for drinking. Um, and it has to last them um, at least a week or two weeks um, when, it, when we didn't have to have, we didn't really have that problem growing up because the water sources were nearby. But also the huge decrease in the availability of water. I mean, it's, just, it's insane. The precipitation is, is nowhere to be seen. Right now, I should be freezing and, and uh, shoveling s some snow in my front driveway, but it's not happening. But what I also have seen that's really changed is the massive development that's going on. Yesterday, I drove up to the Grand Canyon through Williams um, on my way to Valleys, and I couldn't believe the massive amount of homes that were out there because land is cheap. But I'm one thing I left was left wondering is where are they going to get all the water, water and the infrastructure? They have access to it, and here my people on the Navajo Hopi Reservation, and even further than that, don't even have access and don't have the money for it. Um, but that you know that's another conversation. So Just I'm really quick, excited quick that Flagstaff, yes, okay, Flagstaff and um, NAU have a climate action plan. I spoke several times, wait, maybe several times, like one time at the city council um, speaking for uh, the climate emergency plan, which was approved. And, and that's huge, that is so huge. And I'm so proud to be part of a, two communities that believe that should be pushed along. Um, you know why it's important to me? Because it keep, the action plan keeps it on everyone's radar. In the Western world, a printed document, whether it's on your computer or in, you know, that you can feel it like a paper in your hand um, is power and it gives voice and space to all, to not only the people that are fighting for the plan, but also it gives voice and space to the natural elements and the beings. And I'm, and I'm speaking not only on the behalf of the five fingered beings, which is all of us here, but also our relatives that the elk, um, the eagles, the ants, and so forth. Um, and also it gives an insight to how a community can really come together. And I really appreciate all of you. I think there's about 59 of us on this call 
on uh, this afternoon and that means you care and that you want to learn more. So I hope I've given you a small piece of knowledge that you can carry with you and to give you some power uh, and motivation to support and protect our environment. And again, I'm so honored to be part of this wonderful panel and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, I always love hearing your story and I always learn new things and uh, I, I wanna learn more about the work you do. So I hope you're able to share more insight with us as this panel goes on. Uh, I would like to pass it to um, Ted Martinez uh, next to address those, those three questions. You know, what does climate justice mean to you, Ted? And uh, your community, what impacts have you seen? And um, what do you think is the importance or value of a, of a climate action? planning process. Well, thanks, Matt. I just want to thank you and I want to thank Summer uh, for inviting me and um, also to Nikki for your comments. Um, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a lecturer in uh, the NAU Honors College and I have an approach to teaching climate change where I do use fictional novels to, to teach climate change. Um, it's a genre of writing called cli-fi for short. Uh, it's an emerging and growing genre. And uh, personally, I found it to be a very useful tool um, to help tell the story of climate change. Um, when I teach this way, I'm able to focus on the story, on the narrative, on the voice of people, also on the impacts that are happening now and um, impacts that uh, will occur in the future. Um, and so um, there is some science in the, the course, um, but it is not a strictly science narrative. And that, I think that's where I wanna start giving my answer for your question as to what is climate justice. And um, what it means to me is expanding the narrative. There are so many narratives in climate change and there are so many voices and there are currently so many impacts and there are going to continue to be impacts in the future to more people. And while we appreciate the, the work of scientists, of policymakers, of politicians, um, while we appreciate all that work tremendously, some ways the narrative has been captured a little bit. It's been relegated to certain fields and certain people, um, say a researcher, a politician who captures the narrative on a national scale or whatever scale. And so my answer to the first question is, is what does climate justice mean to me, it means letting go of the narratives and expanding the narratives and letting them apply to other people who have a voice, who have their experience. And I think that's what your seminar is getting at today, that we're, we're opening up these narratives, letting, letting those voices out. Um, and so climate justice to me is participation. Um, I always love to see participation. So thank you for letting me participate. Um, uh, you know, thank you, Nikki. Thank you, uh, Mayor uh, Evans. Thank you, everyone, for participating and for tuning in. So it is participation. Um, and I, one more thing I want to add is that, you know, when we think of climate justice, we tend to think of vulnerable populations. And I think the definition of vulnerability is changing daily and monthly and weekly. Um, the narrative started out as the elderly and um, the very young. We had terms like first and worst um, for indigenous populations, people um, who are going to be impacted first. Um, but um, one voice that I think is missing is that, um, you know, uh, Nikki, I'm older than you. I won't say how old I am, but um, um, the younger people, uh, tuning in today, um, I don't know how you'll resonate with this, but I think that you're a vulnerable population, um, and I think that we need climate justice for you. Um, uh, so I don't know how you resonate with those comments, but I want to put forward the idea that, um, 
you don't have to be a newly born person. I think that we thought of the very young, the very old, but I think even just young children, um, teens, um, people in their 20s um, are gonna grow up with more um, climate impacts than I will. And so um, I wanna see justice um, for you in your future as well, because um, in my opinion, it has been discounted and I'm extremely sorry. Um, okay, and so that is my answer about um, climate justice. Um, some things that I've noticed, um, and I love the word community here, um, because it depends on how we define community. Um, I decided in my mind to not just think about Flagstaff. Um, I have a friend who lives, a colleague, um, an honors colleague who lives in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And through the magic of Facebook, <laughs> um, I saw some amazing pictures. I saw some unreal things that I was very sorry to see. It was the effects of the derecho that occurred um, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And um, I saw down trees all over her house. I saw down trees in her front yard. I saw she and her husband chainsawing day after day after day. It seemed like it went on for weeks. Um, power was out. Um, uh, she's a teacher in honor. She had to teach. There was no internet at her house. Um, she talked about trying to just get to a safe space to teach um, her students who were coming back. Um, so I consider her part of my community. She's part of my honors community. So our community ranges further and further. And um, I'll also add, as I thought about this question, I have family who um, grew up in um, uh, Jackson, Talent, and Phoenix, Oregon. And if you followed the Oregon fires, those communities were burnt um, this summer uh, near Ashland. And so, although I wasn't directly there, I know that I have family that is from that area and they were greatly impacted and they wept and they feared for their uh, family members. And so, um, you know, we have this sort of um, expanding community. And so uh, I, I know that maybe others will talk about Flagstaff, um, but uh, I, I, there we've definitely seen some, uh, you know, warmer temperatures here in Flagstaff, but I also want to think of my family as, uh, my community, excuse me, as expanding. Um, and so I guess I'll just move to the, to the last question about, um, I believe this is about the climate action plan for the city of Flagstaff. Um, first, I think I just want to commend um, the city staff, all of them um, for developing this plan. Um, and so I think that's the first thing I want to say. Um, it's a very encompassing plan. It's, it's, kind of, it's difficult for me to make comments, um, but I'll just tell you what I noticed is um, a lot about housing. Um, and there was about energy in housing, availability of housing, um, the tensions in housing. We, we want more affordable housing, but then when you build more houses, people get bristly and mad. Um, so it was a recurring theme that I noticed um, uh, through, the, the, um, through the document. And I think that we know and suspect that um, we will have what you can, we'll just say climate migration, I think in our area, um, as people come here for the cooler temperatures from either Phoenix or somewhere else. So um, we have a housing crisis in the United States. I think I can safely say that. Um, and we have a housing crisis, I think I can safely say that, in um, Flagstaff as well. And I think that um, these are going to be exacerbated. Um, so I do commend the city for um, being on, on top of that and looking forward. Um, and I will just add one thing, and I think I will um, conclude, is I noticed some overarching goals um, that were um, reduce prepare and address um, were three overarching goals. Um, I just want to add, if I could, you know, here on camera, <laughs> um, goals like um, involve and, um, and uh, capacity, um, build capacity. Um, I saw a lot of goals um, and I wondered how they were going to be achieved. Um, and I'm just guessing that more money and staff and resources can always be used. And so I guess that's what I mean by um, 
uh, building additional capacity to take on these challenges and, um, and then just involve a community because um, I think that's how we get justice, that's how we get our voices um, heard is through involvement. So um, I'll conclude there. Thank you, Matt and Summer, and um, thank you. Thank you, Ted. I, uh, I really value that expansion of the idea of community and, and thinking about those broader impacts. I know the last few months uh, for me has uh, led me spending time uh, virtually and physically with family in different places. And it's, uh, it really has yeah, expanded that idea. So thank you for sharing your thoughts, Ted. And um, without further ado, we'd like to get to our third panelist, uh, Mayor Coral Evans. Uh, thank you for joining us today and for sharing your thoughts on on some of these um, climate justice implications and how they've impacted you personally, your community, your work, and also how you think um, climate action plans and, and um, the work of that planning can really help um, take on issues like climate justice. So thank you, uh, Mayor Evans. Um, well, thank you so much, Matt. And I would like to say thank you to Summer and to the Office of Sustainability at um, Northern Arizona University. I am very grateful to be here with all of you and to be a part of this conversation with Director Cooley and Professor Martinez. Um, I appreciate the fact that we have so many people who took time out of their afternoon to have this conversation about um, sustainability and about climate change. I wanted to start off with a quote and I was trying to find out where I got this quote. This is not a quote from me. Um, and so, but I do think it, it, it really puts into perspective um, the conversation about climate justice. The quote goes, in a few decades, the relationship between the environment, resources and conflict may seem almost as obvious as the connection we see today between human rights, democracy and peace. And I really truly think that that um, really defines for me uh, what does climate justice mean. I'm currently working um, on my PhD in sustainability with an emphasis in education through uh, Prescott College. And when I first went to Prescott College, I was very focused on just the social justice um, part of the equation. Um, and then um, as I you know, grew in my program and got more familiar and more understanding of the environmental a justice component. Um, I was really able to weave the two um, together. And for me, that comes out as a climate justice. I, one of the reasons why I think I originally um, struggled was the, was the human element. I think a lot of times when we talk about um, climate change, we forget about the human element and the human people and where do they fit within the overall conversation about climate change. Um, and so I was really appreciative of the fact that, you know, in Matt's opening um, comments, he talked about the people who um, not only were their, their health and their physical being um, at risk, but also the financial livelihood of their families um, as we move into doing something different. Um, and for me, I really focus on the people who are left behind and the people who are most impacted. Uh, and so that's really how I look at climate justice um, it's making sure that there's the human element as well. Um, I told a story, and some of you might have heard this story um, last week, but I talked about my work in Sunnyside and how we were at a community meeting and an individual showed up, and the individual who showed up to the meeting um, walked into the meeting and made the announcement that she was going to show the poor people in Sunnyside how to be sustainable and how to um, be more um, climate friendly. And then she proceeded to tell the group about um, you know, recycling, about riding bikes instead of taking cars, about you know, where to get food from, things like that. Uh, and it was very interesting because after the meeting, you know, no one said every, anything because everybody's polite. But you know, after the meeting, when she went outside and she got into her Prius and she left, there was a whole community conversation about that. You know, Sunnyside is a working class neighborhood. The people there take the bus because that's their only form of transportation, either that or a bike, right? Um, you know, talking about shopping and recycling, you know, many of us shop at Goodwill or at the thrift store already, not because it's a trendy thing to do, but because that is how we grew up and that is our means. You know, a lot of us already have gardens. I grew up in a house 
that um, had a complete urban farm in the back of it, not because it was the trendy thing to do, but because that's actually how we eat, right? Um, and so there was a whole conversation about paying honor to and recognizing that um, people who are at different income levels and people who are at different um, educational levels know as much about the climate than some of us who have degrees are some of us who have money are some of us who have the ability to buy the electric car to plug it into a brand new home that has solar panels, right? So again, that kind of ties back to this whole conversation of climate justice and who gets to be at the table and who gets to talk about it. You know, I am so proud to be third generation daughter of um, Flagstaff. And I wanna be very clear that I say that understanding that there are people who have been here over 500 generations. So when I say I'm proud to be third generation, I'm brand new here in this area. You know, my daughter, you guys might've seen a little mask come in, give me a kiss on the face and then dart out. You know, that's my daughter and she's fourth generation. And we live in a house that my grandfather built. I'm sitting in the dining room of my house my grandfather built in 1942. It was built out of leftover lumber, which is how most of the homes in this particular area were built. It was either leftover lumber, old ammo boxes, or chicken wire, and plaster in my neighborhood. Um, and what we have seen is that, for example, this summer, it hit 96 degrees. 96 degrees in Flagstaff. I live in a house that was built in 1942. We don't have air conditioning. So we have fans running constantly because it was so hot. It was too hot to sleep. You had to literally wait till two o'clock in the morning and then it started getting hot again at six, okay? On the flip side of that, in the winter time, my house also does not have um, central air conditioning. It didn't exist when the house was built. So you have a heater in the front of the house and you have a heater in the back of the house. Well, at some point, the heater in the back of the house, they couldn't get parts for it, right? So, you know, in the wintertime, we kind of hang out in whatever room we're in with a little portable heater, unless we're in the living room where there's a wall heater. So what I have noticed is that before it was never an issue. You know, the house was warm. It was pretty reasonable to do that in the wintertime. It is no longer. In the summertime, you know, we were used to having an electric bill or a gas bill that was like $12 for the, you know, the gas bill, maybe $25 for the electrical bill. That's no longer that case right? Because you have to have these fans blowing 24-7. So, um, you know, when COVID started, I'm going to hit on that too. When COVID started, I had three jobs. COVID started and now I have one. My daughter who was employed does not have one right now. So we are lucky enough to live in the house that my grandfather built. So there's not a mortgage, but now we have high utility bills. Um, the majority of people who live in this neighborhood, um, either they retired from the sawmill or they retired from jobs um, that paid a different wage, right? Even though they worked five, six, sometimes seven days a week. And so people who are living on a fixed income are directly impacted by this climate change. And I don't think we talk enough about those individuals. You know, when you talk about um, the rising heat in Phoenix, what we have seen um, over the course of the summer is a parking lot headed to Flagstaff for all the people who are trying to get out of the heat. You know, growing up, we used to go to Phoenix, when it was 110 in Phoenix, it was like a big deal. I think maybe once or twice as, as a child, it hit 121. Um, and that was just national news. They had 60 days straight of like 115 degree weather. And while, you know, you look at the individuals that are fleeing Phoenix coming up to the, the pines to cool off at 96 degrees, I wanna emphasize that. I can't help but think of the people that are down in Phoenix that don't have that luxury that don't have a summer home in Flagstaff, that don't have a credit card that allows them to get a hotel room, that don't have a car or the money to come up from the day, and how those individuals are having to stay in the heat and how they are able to afford the air conditioning that they need. I can't help but think about that. Just like I can't help but think about uh, some of my friends who live um, you know, on the Georgia coast and how the, um, the poor people actually lived up on the hill and people who had money lived down the beach. Well, now that the beach is rising, you have individuals that are now going up into these neighborhoods and they're buying two or three lots and they're building new homes, right? And they're gentrifying out the people that were originally there. Um, and then where do those people go? Because they can no longer afford to stay in that area. That is what's happening here in Flagstaff. And I think a lot of it has to do with the climate. 
talked to many people who are from Phoenix in California who have decided to relocate here over the summer because they couldn't take the heat. I wanted to go back to COVID and just talk about that and really the access to um, the water, you know, because um, Director Cooley talked about this. Uh, you know, we have here a global pandemic and we're telling everybody that you need to wash your hands for a minimum of 20 seconds. I want to make sure that we're all aware that there are some places in Arizona that do not have running water. And people have to haul their water and water is expensive. And so is the transportation to go pick that water up and bring it back. So I think we just need to acknowledge that. Um, you know, and then lastly, I wanted to talk about um, the impacts to people's health and their economics when it comes to, to um, you know, climate change and things that we're doing. You know, I don't think we're gonna have the opportunity to get really deep into the weeds when it comes to like the issues of uranium that we have here and what that has done um, to uh, Northern Arizona and how that impacts our water. But I do wanna mention that my mom um, was a downwinder who died of breast cancer um, because of what was going on with uranium. And when you look at um, what is going on um, on Navajo and Hopi, and just the impacts of that, um, this too ties back to the concept of environmental justice, of climate justice, of the people part of it. Um, and then lastly, I wanna wrap it back around to what Matt said. You know, one of the things I think that we really need to be mindful of is that when we come, when we, when we talk about climate change and we talk about the new, right? And moving to solar and moving to wind and those things, we need to stop and acknowledge the people who gave us the luxury to be able to sit here and have these conversations. These are the people that worked in the coal mine, right? These are the people that were hanging the trans, the hanging the lines. These were the people that um, were creating the energy that we are currently using to talk about the better energy that we need. And so as we shift from one energy source to another, as we become more um, sustainable or more environmentally friendly, we need to make sure that we bring everybody with us. And I think that's the key when we talk about um, climate justice is the fact that, you know, I talk to people who got laid off, who lost their job, who maybe didn't have the four-year college degree, but just had that high school diploma. And they were able to make six figures and they were able to support their entire family not just their immediate family, but grandma, the mom, a cousin, you know, that type of thing. And all of a sudden they're jobless and we've moved on to the new because it's better than, but we've kind of forgot them. And I think that's where the rub is that we hear. That's where the friction is, right? That we get is that people don't see themselves in this new, right? And so I would just say that I think that we need to do a better job um, as environmentalists, as people who care about climate um, change and climate justice, to make sure that everybody sees themselves uh, as, a, as a part of the solution and everybody sees themselves as the ability to um, grow and prosper. And that we remind ourselves that just because you don't have that, that scientific degree and maybe you don't speak the language. You don't have to speak the language to know that I grew up playing in the Rio de Flag right behind this house and guess what? It don't run anymore, right? But it used to run every day and used to play in it. Like you don't need to Quick have- two minutes, Coral. Thank right. you. Sorry like, to cut you off. You don't need to have a degree to have that type of conversation. So those were just really all of the things that I had to say. Um, I hope I answered all three of those questions. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. No, thank you, Mayor Evans, for sharing uh, your time and also just the lived experience. I think, um, yeah, as someone who is a first generation transplant, you know, I was born in the Midwest, but grew up uh, as a kid in Prescott, it's, I have so much to learn. And um, I think the point of, of bringing everyone with us, I think, is um, something I've been hearing more and more, which gets me excited about the, the current state of um, the climate movement or environmental movement is, is people are realizing that that is that is the key. Um, and I'll stop talking. I want to share some uh, some conversation with the audience. So I think I got it working. So I'm going to share my screen again and uh, we'll come back uh, 
to the panelists um, in just a moment. Um, but if you haven't already, it looks like quite a few people did include some of their thoughts already. Go to sift.ly, S-I-F-T.ly in your uh, URL bar up here, and then it'll prompt a code and just type in justice. And then you'll be able to add your, your comments and thoughts here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scroll down and kind of scroll through and, and see if we can kind of pull out any common themes or uh, ideas or, you know, where are we all landing on this idea of what is, um, what is climate justice? What does it mean to you? So I see be behavior change on a large scale, dignity, ethical treatment of people and planet, uh, supporting each other, uh, fairness, recognition, equality, fairness again uh, for communities and, and individuals. Um, historical injustice, co-production, protecting the most vulnerable. Um, I'm going to start skipping some just because there's a lot, but <clears throat> equitable access. I see that twice in these, both of these responses. Uh, maybe someone added, it looks like, uh, living environment and protecting those that will end up the front lines of climate change, uh, inclusivity or inclusion, uh, deep understanding, open mind, um, community resilience, equity again. Radical action and listening, radical listening, even as a term I've heard, what does that mean uh, to listen radically and really open yourself up to new, um, new ideas? Uh, I'm going to share just quickly on this uh, app, I can show a word cloud, which I think is always helpful to kind of see how the words break down. Um, and um, I'd invite any of the, the panelists to, to share any of the words that jump out for them. Um, before we move on to the next question. Equity. And community. Yeah. I see access right front and center. I also see people, which is something that's been talked about today. Yeah. Change. It's a little, it's a little, uh, not that bright, but it's mm. in big letters. <laughs> so I've right. seen that it's been mentioned several times. That's huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to keep us moving along. Um, we're just running through the, the same questions that we asked the panel. So we want to hear from you all. Um, in your life, uh, what significant changes or have you noticed any significant changes in your community? And what are those, those changes that you experienced? Um, here in Flagstaff or maybe where, where you grew up or uh, your community at large? Um, what significant changes have you experienced? More people. Increase, I think that's homelessness or houselessness there. Heat waves. Uh, rising heat. I'm gonna take a moment and just write down my own as well, but um, feel free to keep entering those responses. Less water, uh, mosquitoes, possibly more mosquitoes, uh, heat, heat waves, less water, less electricity, 
Um, positive note, more educational uh, or education surrounding climate change and recycling efforts, compost, uh, increased cost of living, um, less sense of place as we all become a little more, uh, tra um, more transplants in our own ways or in a more digital sense where we do move around. I think on this one, I'm, I'm not going to use the word cloud feature. I feel like there's so many uh, unique words, um, but I will move us on to the next one. And I'll, I'll make sure that we uh, share this information uh, that you all have shared with us um, through our, our website, um, which is just neu.edu slash cap for climate action plan. And just, I think this is, this is, these are some of the building blocks, just understanding where we're at as a community. Um, Thank you everyone for your responses. I'm gonna to go to our, our last sort of engagement question. How do you think uh, the climate action plan, and I think this references the cities, which has been formally adopted and, and been acted upon the past two years, and also currently our NAU process as we update and redevelop our own climate action efforts. Uh, how can those plans help with climate justice? And what ways, should, what issues or, or areas should um, we focus or, or could have the greatest impact. So we'll just take a few minutes, um, take some time and, and appreciate any and all responses on, on this question. And I guess I'll invite the panelists here. If, if you see an answer that sticks out to you or you'd like to speak a little bit to, feel free to, to share a little more. Matt, this is Nikki. I just saw one that said normalizing new and positive change. I really like that normalizing the changes in like the voices and uh, the positive changes. Well, some people may see that as negative, depending on what they're what they're they believe in. So that was one that stood out to me. Yeah, thanks. Change is so hard, I think, for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, but how do we normalize that as a part of our, our changing climate and changing political, social situation? I wanted to just mention, because um, I do think this is important, you know, there's one that I just saw that had to do with evidence-informed decisions um, over economic-centered ones. I 100% agree with that, but I also think there's a nuance that sometimes the evidence, you will have a group of individuals who have a lived experience that may or may not match the evidence because there's also the bias into where there is a bias somewhat as to where the evidence is coming from. And that it's important that you, um, you take into account the non-scientific, for lack of a better way of putting it, um, ponderance of evidence that is coming from that lived experience of that group. And I sometimes think we overlook that um, because of who that group is or where that group is at or what credentials that group doesn't have. Um, but there is validity to their lived experience, even if they cannot necessarily articulate it in a way that shows up on a graph. So I just feel the need to say that. Yeah, thanks Coral for sharing that insight. Um, any other comments? I think this will, uh, remain open this this app through the remainder of the presentation. So if something else comes to you or an idea, um, this is really helpful and, and will help us in our, our current efforts and um, working with alongside the city as well uh, in the community. Um, I'm going to go back to the, the presentation and um, I would like uh, folks, if you have any questions for the panelists, to please uh, put them in the chat. 
Um, we'll spend about, I want to say, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up here uh, with some closing statements. But I want to have uh, a chance for the audience to ask some, some specific questions. You can title it just for the panel or, or to a specific panelist. Um, and uh, put those in the, the chat. I think that's going to be the, the easiest way. And I'll do my best to, to bring them up as they come in. Um, I think so I can I can start off as as folks please uh, put some questions in the chat there for the panelists. Um, I had a question for uh, Nikki just I know you work uh, so deeply with with tribes across the the country and uh, these folks who have just such deep um, environmental knowledge of this land. Um, what in your work do you find is is the most difficult um, in terms of implementing some of these these um, climate actions or adaptation steps, or what are some of the biggest barriers that you have come across in your experience? Um, I have worked with tribes um, all over Alaska to all the way to north the northeast and Mi'kmaq, a restook band of Mi'kmaq Indians to the uh, Choctaw Mississippi band of Choctaw Indians all the way to the south. Uh, on, or west coast and the the number one barrier is probably of course funding but it's it's, it's also the tribal the capacity to carry these um implementation um projects out um often federal funding that we rely heavily upon unfortunately um is often set aside only for building that capacity right to get the training to actually write the plan um to even understand what the climate change impacts are um and trying to find a focus on that but funding and the capacity if you don't know already, and you should know, because um, some of you are probably going to work with tribe, tribal and indigenous communities all over the world, is that um, there can be a high turnover rate. And that's, again, due to the lack of funding to keep one person in a position for so long. And remember, tribes, although they're sovereign, we're not all rich unless you work with the Seminole tribe of Florida who used to own Hard Rock Cafe uh, franchise. They have a successful casino. Not all tribes are that way. Um, we don't get a per cap. We don't get free money from the government, as a, which is a common belief. Um, so uh, yeah, that's a big uh, number one. And I, I hear that quite a bit. Like, And that's my job at ITEP is to, if there's one person who's the water resource director, the cultural resource director, the bus driver. Yes, this is actually a person that I've come across doing. And then also the climate change coordinator, uh, the youth director. Um, then my job is to support that person and, and whatnot. So th good question, Matt. Thank you, Nikki. Um, it looks like we had a couple questions. Uh, one from Emily Hackett. Um, it looks like Ted answered, so that's great. Um, some good books um, that uh, Ted uses or, uh, in the classroom and some interesting topic. Ted, anything else to add uh, besides some of these, these titles? Uh, where should we begin? What's a good one to start with? Um, a very good one to start one. I just happen to have my books here. <laughs> They're ready. Uh, about, uh, flights, uh, Flight Behavior by Barbara Kingsolver is a good one to start with. Uh, it involves um, the migration of monarch butterflies uh, when it goes awry. Um, so Barbara has a background as a biologist, um, but also a very influential writer. And um, there are some, some tropes in here of, of your average citizens, of scientists and the way they communicate, as well as journalists, the way they handle um, a subject like climate change are, are all featured in this book, um, so it's a great place to start. Um, here's another interesting one called The Water Knife, if, you, if anyone's heard about this one, by uh, Paolo Basagalupi. Um, this one is about Phoenix um, in the future, so if you are in Arizona, this one's very interesting, very exciting, dramatic. Um, <laughs> I think it's kind of like a crime mystery novel. It's kind of a lot of action, um, but it does take place almost exclusively in Phoenix. Um, so uh, those are uh, two really good ones to start with. Um, 
yeah, they'll get you. There's, it's a huge genre. There's so much available. Um, another great one, New York 2140 by Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, I've been teaching this class for years and I've made it a personal policy. I've never taught the same novel twice. I only teach it once because we have to keep moving. The canon is growing so large. I have to learn the new novel every semester um, because the, the canon is just, it's just growing. Um, so lots of good novels, just Google a sci-fi literature search. Fi, that's awesome. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. And uh, you must have uh, a lot of bookshelves uh, if you're yeah. getting new books every year. Yeah. Um, I have a question from Eric Nolan, uh, and maybe um, maybe Mayor Evans, if you feel up for this one. Um, but on a local level, what is the next step to better ensure climate justice? And yeah. So I would say that right now, um, and I think this ties back to what Professor Martinez um, was saying when he was talking about how do you further th this plan, right? And that comes down to resources. Right now, the city of Flagstaff is going through a priority-based budgeting conversation where we're asking the community to weigh in with what their priorities are. Um, and so I think that that is one way um, that the community could actively be involved in, um, in, 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 in furthering the step and how do we get there. Also, I just have to say um, our community, and this was something else was pointed out by Mr. Martinez, that has to do with the issue of housing. And housing is all throughout the cap. Quite frank, frankly, housing is all throughout our regional plan. You know, the concept of density over sprawl, which means that you're going to go up. And that is something that our community is very much um, at conflict with. You know, uh, we talk about the need for affordable housing, yet we also um, don't necessarily want to see anything built. Um, and I think that that is, that is a conversation of that the community is going to really have to sit down and kind of reflect back on themselves um, and, and really come to grips as to what does that mean? And, and what does that look like if we're really talking about the affordability of things? Um, and so those are my thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks. I think your perspective from the governmental uh, point of view is really, really valuable. And, and um, it's that question is sort of the, the magic question, you know, and how do we how do we solve this? And I think um, uh, your response and just priority based budgeting and, and addressing those issues is, is, um, is huge. Um, the next question I'm looking at is from Jim Gale. Um, what are some potential climate solutions in the CAP or Climate Action Plan that can be focused on training or jobs for the most affected by climate change? Um, the typical privilege would not again receive the same contract or project. And I'm wondering if, Nikki, you have any thoughts on this in terms of, you know, I'm thinking of the Navajo Generating Station and the Peabody Coal Mine. Um, what are some ideas or ways that we can help train um, through this transition of, of cleaner energy sources, but also just the climate change, less water, um, ways that we could um, focus on that? Nikki, are you, uh, if you're speaking, you're on mute, and if, uh, we can open this up to the rest of the panel as well. Yes, sorry, my son. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. I had an emergency to run out and get my son, so. <laughs> oh, it's um, totally I'm, fine. I missed the question, so if someone could take it and then I can go, I apologize. No can problem. I help me catch up? So I do have a question about this, so I'll just like pop in real quick and I'll pop out. One of the things that um, I was talking to a group of individuals about last week had to do with the concept of retraining. You know, here in Arizona, we have a huge need for like pipe fitters, um, machinists, um, heavy concrete people. And so one of the things I was talking to this group about was how can we, as we know that different um, power plants are being phased out, is there a way for some of these um, unions, quite frankly, to go into these power plant plants with apprenticeship programs? And so maybe the individuals work for six hours at their job, and then maybe they do an apprenticeship for the other two hours, a paid apprenticeship. And then that way, 
as these jobs are phased out, when they get their severance pay, they're going to get like a one-time shot of a, pre, a, a severance pay. They also walk out with a certificate. So it's a certificate in welding. It's a certificate in, in electricity. It's a certificate that allows them to then go and get a job in the fields that are related to all of the new technology. So that's one, um, one thought there and one idea that we are trying to work on. Thanks, Mayor Evans. Um, it looks like, again, Ted is active on the chat, uh, answered Sydney's question about um, how to connect undergrad students with climate action who may not currently be enrolled in, in the class and ways to get plugged in. I would also just add uh, to Sydney's comment that there's quite a few uh, clubs, student clubs, like the Green Jacks and Thrift Jacks and uh, um, NEU Divestment Club looking at fossil fuel, uh, removing fossil investments in our endowment, um, uh, the Green Collective, um, there's quite a few. Um, but I am curious, Ted, if you have anything to add here. And I know you work a lot with undergraduate research, and that was a question I had for you, jotted down, just how to connect undergraduates to this topic that it can be so uh, nuanced and sometimes hard to put a finger on. Um, have you seen any good projects or, or ways for those student, students to get plugged in? Um, well, I mean, there are these, these one-off events um, that I put there. Uh, I think your clubs are a very good recommendation. Um, we might be starting a QB uh, climate action pod um, with sustainable communities. It, it's not on the books yet, um, but we're working on that. And so if we do develop the QB climate action pod, uh, that would be a good access point where undergraduates could, you know, QB, it's community and university, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna mess it up, uh, public inquiry. <laughs> um, so a way for undergraduates to get involved in the community and, um, and do research with NAU that is very outward facing um, uh, research can sometimes be insular and look inward a lot. So I think this, these QP pods are a way to look outward to the community to make sure that our research at NAU um, helps the community. Um, so if we do get that QP pod going, I think that'd be a great place, but that might not be till next fall. Thanks, Dr. Martinez. Um, I think we have just a couple minutes left for questions here. Um, so maybe we'll just take one more if that's all right. And if anyone has responses to any of the other questions, feel free to plug them in the chat. I think this is uh, so valuable, this sort of um, cross uh, communication that we're having. So um, I think I'd like to, the next question I have is Catherine Dunlap and I'd like to share um, that one because I think it's interesting, uh, not specifically uh, just for CLIFI or, uh, climate change in general, but uh, thinking about how the narrative around um, how we address community issues, I think has changed. And I'm wondering if, if each panelist might um, briefly touch on that um, and just speak to uh, this changing narrative. And I, I recently watched um, a filmed recording of uh, Dr. Federici's uh, sabbatical work on uh, narratives around climate change. Um, uh, Dr. Federici is a professor here in the Sustainable Communities Program. And it was so insightful to learn, you know, all these myths that have entrapped um, the progress of, of working on the science-based issue, but also I think this idea of representation and how do we include um, all voices in, in sort of that um, changing narrative piece. But I guess just briefly, if each panelist might say a few words to that changing narrative. Um, I'll start, I think it's a great uh, question, Catherine. Um, and I think there is grounds um, to be made in literature and science. Um, those ones seem evident to me. Um, and part of the narrative is that um, we're gonna seek a science or technological solution to climate change. And not that that is out of the question, but it is not the only answer. And I think that the arts, the humanities, um, participation from all citizens um, is going to be part of the solution. And I think there's been a myth and a little bit of a narrative 
uh, a little bit of a myth to the narrative that science is going to solve this for us. I'm not trying to put down anyone here who's in the sciences. I'm in the sciences myself. I just want to see the narrative expanded to um, to more areas because I, I believe there's so many more areas. It's just a false narrative, I think, in our society that the answer is going to come um, from one area. Um, and so I'll leave it at that. Oh, no, I, I want to add one more thing. Um, I do have a section in my class on climate and faith, um, uh, religious faith, because I think there's a lot of narratives spinning around in there that are kind of false as well. Um, and then there's some much better narratives about um, earth care and, um, and really that um, politics have invaded um, Christianity to some degree and that um, those who remain very close to the scripture in its truest form can really see how climate change fits in and that it's not a, it's not a hoax, it's not a false narrative. And, and so when we look at how many um, people identify as being um, religious in the United States, it's a, I think it's a large group where we can um, make inroads to, um, to finding our, the side that we're, we're all on. So I'll stop at that. Thanks, Ted. Um, Mayor Evans. So, um, you know, really my thoughts on, on this is that, um, you know, here in the, here in the neighborhoods, we have a phase, we have a phrase that we use and it is, are you a part of this community or do you just live here? Are you a part of this neighborhood or do you just live here? Okay. And I really think that, um, that speaks directly to what I think um, is going to be the issue. And that if we are going to change the narrative, and it's not necessarily changing the narrative, it's broadening the narrative, or it's expanding the narrative, or it's letting everybody have the opportunity to write at least one line in this book, for lack of a, a better way of putting it. Um, what I see, our biggest loss here in the community, this is just me personally, is a loss of community. It's the loss of a sense of community. It's the loss of the ability to have the one-on-one -on -one interactions. It's the gentrification of areas where people were um, close-knit and tight. And now we have, everybody has a garage. You drive into your garage, you close your garage door. You have an HOA, so there's nothing out front in front of your house, so no one can really sell who lives there and what they like. And you spend all your time in the backyard. That's literally it. You know, and then we have, um, like right now, we're all on Zoom because of COVID. But even prior to this, we spent a lot of time online and with our little clicks, right? And so I think that if we want to expand the narrative, then we need to get back to what community means. And community means that interaction um, with people, that one-on-one -on -one time with people, that looking over the fence, you know what? I might not agree with the color your house is painted, but here's a cup of sugar and can we have a conversation? Uh, and I know that so sounds kind of like, I guess, um, Mayberry, for lack of a better word, but we have so many issues that we are going to have to address as a society, as a community, as a neighborhood, as a block. Part of that means that we're going to have to develop a relationship and have the mutual respect and have a, a basic consciousness or empathy for what the other person is going through. So then we can turn around and talk about the hard things. Right now we're trying to talk about the hard things and we have zero relationship built. So there's a lack of trust, there's a lack of respect, there's a lack of um, human to it. So that's what I think. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Nikki Cooley. Yes, um, this has been a topic that we've been talking about within the ITEP tribes and climate change about the narrative. It really depends on who you talk to. And when you define narrative, looking in the dictionary, it says a spoken or written account, right? And, um, but native indigenous narratives stories have been deemed um, anecdotal. When I did my master's project with the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, and I often heard, not from my professors, but from a lot of people, that it was it was it's not true because there was no number there were no numbers assigned to it. So changing that narrative, it's 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 not it's non it has to be non linear. 
there, it, it, there's not just a straight line from the beginning to the end, but there's ra rather it's like, you know, your body's bloodline or the river, uh, the river's ecosystem. There's a lot of tributaries um, to the river. And I'm thinking about the Colorado because it's right there. Um, so it, it's not all about the beginning to the end in the straight line. It's going off, off and into the different corridors and finding the different stories that contribute to that narrative that contribute to the meaning of of what this tribe or this community and how they're responding to to climate change and um, also changing that attitude um, you know I, for a long time i um i i grew up um hearing that the humans the five-fingered people were the beings were superior and I, I always thought that was just so wrong because and ultimately we are inferior to the natural elements. We can't survive without them. Corporations, commercials, the, the, the global consumerism has taught us or brainwashed us to think that we are superior to the natural elements. I literally, I cry when I see a development because I know somebody's home was lost. The ant, the insect, the, the, the getting emotional, the elk. So we have to stop thinking about that and in that way. And, um, you know, um, just something what um, Mayor Evans just said about changing it, change is good. Um, you know, Catherine Hayhoe, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe from Texas Tech, uh, you know, climate atmospheric scientist said, you know, before COVID, people thought it was impossible to hold conferences and meetings, meaningful meetings over the internet. And yet here we are. And they said it was impossible. And she's actively like not traveling even before COVID to reduce her carbon footprint because she wanted to talk the talk and I th or walk the talk. And I think more of us need to know that and also be in that mindset. Remember, we are not superior. We would not last without all those different insects, those uh, animals and email, you know, just read, um, who is that one, that one guy that writes about ants? I just, mm. anyways, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought. But yeah, so changing that narrative, it's not linear. So I encourage all the young people on this um, and the leaders, arising leaders and current leaders on this call to think about it in that way. So um, with that, I'll pass it back to Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki, so much uh, for sharing those thoughts. And um, I, I feel like, um, you know, uh, Dr. Martinez just had to leave and I, I feel like um, those are some powerful words uh, from all the panelists, and I think um, we'll we'll wrap up there if that's okay. And um, I do want to say, if there's any other call to actions or things that uh, either Mayor Evans or Nikki would like to share, please uh, do so. And then I'll uh, ask Summer uh, Peltier to to close it out for us. But before we do that, any any parting words? I just want to say thank you um, for having the opportunity to be here with um, all of you um, to have this conversation um, and just stress the importance of reestablishing our sense of community um, as as individuals, we can do that. And if each one of us were to take that on, then you would have a network that's a community. Thanks. Do I get last parting words too? Yes. <laughs> Even though I've said Please. I said something already, um, but um, my parting words to you all is that it is possible to do, to make this a better world. Um, you know, my uh, you probably have read this somewhere about me, about my grandfather saying that I would have to warrior up um, someday. And I think my time, um, our time has really come where we need to be continually involved. My, Director and Marie Chili and my co director my co manager always say, you know what, you say yes a lot to a lot of these talks and a lot of these, uh, you know, requests. And I always, 99% of the time, I say yes because it's important to lend our voice to these conversations that lead to action, that lead to change. And I would feel awful if I just sat around and didn't do anything and could have said, coulda, woulda, shoulda, and be a keyboard warrior. 
So we all have to collectively, again, come together, seek out those diverse voices and, and invite them to your table, to any table and, and whatnot. So I am, again, I am so honored to be on here with Mayor Coral Evans and um, Ted Martinez, two people I really look up to. Um, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for everyone for coming. Thank you, especially to Mayor Cole Evans, Nikki Cooley, and Ted Martinez. I know he had to leave. Um, I appreciate all of you taking your time um, to come here and discuss climate change um, in this webinar today. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to sneak in and say a big thank you to Summer for planning and hosting uh, this event with me. Um, it was a real pleasure and an important conversation that will continue. So thank you all. Thanks, everyone.